Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and good night, good people around the world. This is the Blackout Chat, two witches that get together at the kitchen table. You can all join us around the kitchen table. We decided that today. <laughs> and we just talk about, get together every Friday and talk about magic and witchcraft. And we are your hosts. I'm Lee W. Johnson, and that is Kai. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you do not know us, I know everybody in the chat does, but if you don't know us because you're watching later, then go and have a look in the description. You will find a link tree, got that one right, link tree to our Black Hat chat, and you can find everywhere we are. We're on, or well, as the Wildwood Temple on Facebook and Discord server. And you'll also find us on Patreon and Ko-fi, where you can get our... TV and movie reviews of witchy stuff and magic stuff. All right, and super today, fun. this is super fun and super funny as well. <laughs> I get to edit to edit them. I was editing them today. I was in hysterics. Um, today we're talking about the, the working witch. Now I have to admit something. Years back, when I first heard the term working witch. I thought it referred to a, a witch who had a day job. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess they do have a day job. It's just witchy in nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah. So, yeah, we're talking about people um, who have chosen to be professional witches. Uh, mm. And other terms i guess i should add because there are a few people you know that are professional witches in fact in my news this morning was an article about uh britain's first witch files taxes um mm. and uh i think it was deduct she was filing deductions for uh potion ingredients that yeah. somehow made the news um mm. But there are plenty of other people and other terms uh, that are applied, uh, you know, like Peller and Cunning Man, Cunning Woman, um, Folk Healers, uh, and then we get into, you know, other traditions, of course, with Mambos and Santeros and Curanderas and all that sort of stuff. So there's lots and lots of terms. We're not just talking only about people who call themselves a witch in this capacity. Uh, professional magic purveyors. Uh, we might say, although that gets to be a sticky technical term when it comes to legally doing such things. Mm. Yeah, I know. But I'm not sure if it's actually something that has to go on websites uh, in South Africa, but I know in the US you have to put a disclaimer on mm -hmm. um, that it's all for entertainment purposes and there is nothing guaranteed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's that's a legal disclaimer that has to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard said, like the traditional healers in South Africa called Sangomas. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, in East Sangomas and the Inyangas. Um, but yeah, they because they anybody who does any kind of spiritual work and charges for it, charges money for their their services and their time, um, falls into this bracket really. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a group of people, and there always have been, and I think there always will be, that consider any spiritual working, anything at all, whether it's a healing, whether it's a candle working, whether it's a tarot reading, whatever it is, they consider because it's spiritual, it should not be charged for because money is physical, mundane. And therefore, the two don't, don't go together. Um, unfortunately, many people make a living from doing this. And because of that, they have to charge money. That's the exchange of energy that takes place. Wow. Uh, I think, you know, back in the day, way, way, way back in the day, with the witch in the forest, they still had an exchange of energy. They were given gifts and foods and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was a barter that happened. Yeah, lots of traditional societies, um, when they're small enough to have 
a village witch or a local folk healer or cunning man or something like that, they would have bartered, not necessarily using currency for uh, everything, saving it mm -hmm. for, for when it was needed. So I think that was pretty common. Now, some of this depends upon tradition. There are plenty of traditions where uh, you're expected to have a professional uh, that makes money and money is exchanged for these professional services. I think where we run into it in modern um, Wiccan influenced neo-pagan groups, neo-pagan communities, especially because they are a blend of a bunch of different traditions. You know, uh, what we call the pagan community, not everybody practices the same thing by a long stretch. Uh, but I think it's influence from the dominant Protestant Christian overculture. Because mm -hmm. Catholicism, you, you pay for spiritual services. Uh, that, that has been the history of things for a very, very long time in Catholicism. Money is exchanged for spiritual services, for the work that the priests are doing. However that works, sometimes, you know, it's um, ties, sometimes it's direct payment for specific services, but the community collectively supports the work of the priest and his livelihood. They pay for his house and his food and so on and so forth. So he can do the priest job. But um, one of the protests of the Protestants was that that shouldn't happen. That paying the money in the church was evil. And the money in the church was corrupting and the physical was uh, bad and no good and should be separated from the spiritual. And so that idea, of course, you know, Protestant churches still have ways of supporting their clergy full-time clergy who have jobs doing that but there is definitely that idea and it's become part of western overculture that is largely protestant christian a lot of ideas in our western overculture are influenced by that and i think that bleeds through into our pagan communities partially because we do not have an overarching tradition where everyone has read the same material or been taught the same way that this is what we believe about money a lot of times it's not addressed or there are widely differing opinions because it's a bunch of different traditions and a lot of people uh, don't necessarily study in the process of becoming a witch or a member of the pagan community and so mm -hmm. there are at a wide <coughs> variety of stages of transitioning into a pagan worldview and not even then necessarily does that mean that that is uh, a question in their worldview whether or not money is evil some come to the conclusion that it absolutely is and others don't but i think there's a lot of these um foundational building blocks of our worldview that we inherit from our overculture unconsciously because that's how worldviews are built that are not examined uh when we decide to be pagans or witches or heathens or, or whatever path we're on uh that is one reason I was drawn to heathenry is because there is a very specific, um, hey, the heathen worldview is wildly different. You're going to have to go through and work your way through these steps and examine all of these pieces to figure out how to understand that and enter into a heathen worldview. But that's mm -hmm. not present in all paths by any means. And so a lot of these unexamined assumptions you know, we carry through and then when they get challenged, here's the worst part. We can carry these unexamined assumptions and, you know, get our little bits of confirmation bias here and there and little bits that kind of wave at it. But when it is directly challenged, 99% of the time the reaction is not, oh, let me examine that and change my mind. The reaction is, how dare you challenge what is foundational? Now I have mm -hmm. to double down on it. It's just what we humans do, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just the way it works. It doesn't make us bad, but um, it does make this particular debate, can you charge money for the craft and spiritual services, really, really heated. 
because mm. it's hitting at those core foundational unexamined bits of worldview. Usually if you've taken the time to pick those things apart, um, examine them and decide, you will have good reasons for what you've decided. You've, you've rationalized them, you've chosen them on purpose, but you'll also recognize that when you get more information, it may be time to re-examine it because you've been through that process. You know that's how that works. You may mm -hmm. not do it in the emotional moment of having a, an argument, but you'll be aware that these foundational ideas can be challenged and can be changed and are a part of being a witch growing on a pagan path. Mm -hmm. uh, you only said I've, I've seen some heated debates about accepting money for services in groups. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot lately for some reason. Um, I'll get into some of those now. Yeah. Or one of them anyway. I think it, um, it weirdly happens in spring here. Really? <laughs> it's one of the things <laughs> I've noticed and I cannot figure out why. <laughs> I don't know. People are waking up. <laughs> it's Aries season. The sun just crossed into Aries and everybody's hot headed. I don't know, <laughs> but it noticeably happens in spring <laughs> around mm -hmm. here that all of a sudden everybody's, you shouldn't charge for that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something you said just now, which actually extends beyond the whole professional working witch into the just the basis of money is evil. money is considered to be evil and therefore it should not cross paths with the spiritual. Um, it was actually Jason Miller, uh, he wrote Financial Sorcery and there's something you mentioned in there. It's that there, there aren't enough books and information out there about doing money magic, but mm. not just money magic, financial magic. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, that continuous flow of financial magic and money magic instead of just those emergency set for emergency magic uh, mm -hmm. things that we need to do um and he said the main reason is because people think that money is evil and money should not cross paths with the spiritual therefore people who are on a spiritual path feel guilty almost doing any kind of financial sorcery yeah to gain gain you know money and finances in their life and abundance yeah which it kind of opposes what's, what's happening with the New Age uh, movement at the moment, with all the manifestation techniques that are coming out. Mm. And this, you know, it started with the secret, mm -hmm. and it just blew up, completely exploded from there. Yeah, well... That, that's become a big thing. See, I see that as the influence of the prosperity gospel, uh, combined with the very cult, uh, similar... Uh, thought processes in the new age and so it's really easy to get onto that uh, kind of process and the rise of MLMs and pyramid schemes that are in that new age genre because people are mm. are wanting to get away from an overculture of Christianity but again without examining all of the the foundational pieces they often end up in Christianity with, uh, you know, pink and lavender and gold wash over the top of it. So it looks like something else. And I mean, being Christianity as some a friend of mine calls it. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and it's focused on the prosperity gospel and, and the pyramid scheme ideals and the cult scheme ideals. Cause those are all really very, very similar. They're, mm. you know, birds of a feather kind of thing, but yeah, I, I think about 20 years ago in the pagan community, one thing we talked about a lot was how can you pr practice a fertility religion based on abundance and think money is evil? Mm -hmm. You know, it creates this dichotomy in you because you'll accept abundance, but not in the form of money. And if that's your, your core belief, that's that's your magic running all the time, shaping the reality around you. And a lot of times we talked about it as the uh, pagans love to be poor. Mm. You know, it was this idea, again, that if you were really spiritual, then you were divorced from the physical. And there was a complete separation. And yet, practicing a fertility and abundance religion. Like, 
those those don't mesh those don't go together those don't make a cohesive understood worldview yeah uh, craig says hi hi craig, hi, craig. Okay. um it actually reminds me of and I've, i forget all of the names but um the monk who um founded the shaolin temple when he originally got there, he found a bunch of monks in this temple who were completely separating themselves from the physical in order to attain the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And their bodies were just withering away, which is why he started to brought in um, martial arts and the actual physical exercises, mm. which overlaid with the spiritual as well in order to get their bodies strong, strong again so that they could become strong spiritually. Um, which I thought was, it was, I think that's an absolutely brilliant approach. I mean, we are a whole system. We can't just ignore one thing for the other. Otherwise, we, we break down one part and the rest of it breaks down. Well, I think there's a, a key component in uh traditions that can have a separation of physical and spiritual because you need a physical body to pursue spiritual truths you can't pursue the learning of the spiritual path without sustaining a physical body you gotta eat you gotta sleep mm -hmm. you gotta drink you have to be sustained and so that is either done through self-sufficiency for which you need money in our world we live in capitalist societies there's no denying that or you need uh, somebody else to support you and in the case of spiritual that's often a community you know mm -hmm. uh, and so if you live in a society and a community where a, a group of people have those beliefs that the spiritual is separate from the physical but the spiritual is valued enough to support the physical of this person so that they can pursue it often for the community then you can do that and it works. Mm -hmm. uh, paganism isn't like that. We don't have big communities that are large enough to support spiritual um, gurus or teachers or, or shamans or that sort of thing. We straight up don't. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of yeah. people dream about it. A lot of people um, speak, you know, their dreams about communes and that sort of thing and living in pagan societies. But that's not where we're at at this point. You know, I think some people have done it or even tried to do it, but the problem mm -hmm. is it gets to a point where I think a, a certain level of power starts taking over and they, it goes to the head and it just ends up being, well, labeled a cult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, whether whether that was their aim to begin with, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, when we, we did our show on cults, we talked about, you know, sometimes things just slide that way mm -hmm. due to unexamined things you know uh it's not not necessarily that these people set out to create cults and harm people uh, but there is definitely the option for that particular sickness to grow and sometimes they do they some people totally do set out to create cults and harm people um mm. and they often tell you right to your face early on i'm making a cult and they're very proud of it it's very strange mm. but anyways <laughs> money <laughs> money and working witchcraft not cults <laughs> um craig asks, do you think the energy in the transaction is what seems to give money its personality um there is definitely you need that energy in the transaction i don't think it would give money its personality though money is just the the means to an end um you know as i was saying if, if it was a a traditional community then the community might support the shaman or witch or whatever it is physically and actually give them a house, um, bring them food and actually, you know, attend to their needs, their physical needs. But in the society we live in, sure, I can get food and what have you to feed myself from, from people I help, but I've still got to pay the rent and I've still got to pay the internet. Mm -hmm um that's that requires money so money is just one of those those aspects of the bartering system at the end of the day um i don't know yeah. that i see money as having a personality i'm not sure 
Maybe I'm not understanding what you mean like that by that, but I think when it comes when it comes to money and having a personality, you know, we speak of money in the sense of it being a person. We hate money. Oh, see, we I've, like money. We love money. I've done you know, all the work to get rid of those kinds of thoughts long ago because yeah. they're not conducive to magic. <laughs> yeah. I found yeah. them as as hampering limitations. So out with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's also how I I think a magician should be. That's how I think a witch should be. Um, constantly re-examining your own beliefs and optimizing for, um, you know, the best outcome. And the best outcome is often, you know, thriving, not just surviving. And with freedom to pursue your spiritual, religious, magical goals. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of magical goals, they cost money, especially astrological magic rubies get expensive after a while when you need to make more talismans and you need gold for this and you need silver for that and yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean that is the medium of exchange i i would love to do some crazy youtube stunt where i started with a hairpin and traded it up to five star rubies that i could engrave for a talisman but uh no i don't have time for that i have to study how to make the talisman <laughs> <laughs> so mm, Andrea said hello. Hello Andrea. Hello. Nice to see you. Um Yolandi said money for daily living is not evil. It is the greed of wanting too much is what makes money evil, just my opinion. Now I was actually told years back um there's actually a certain point, I can't remember the amount, just speaking in South African terms of of South African rand, um, but it was X amount, or millions or billions of rands. Once a person has attained that, they don't money doesn't interest them anymore. All they want then is power. Mm. I think then it becomes evil. Well, power yeah. over people is evil, and often people who exploit and work in power over dynamics can accumulate a large amount of money in our society. Mm -hmm. But I don't think having a large amount of money automatically makes someone evil. It's often the many mm -hmm. choices and um, priorities they expressed on the way to get there that we display as evil, valuing money over someone else's life or someone else's quality of life. And that's, you know, that's greed. Mm. And that's not good, but I think it is um, a bit hyperbole to equate charging for a reading or a candle burning to being greedy. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's the same, same with magic. I mean, we're always talking about magic is not black or white. It's the magician. Um, it's the person using the tool that decides what they want to do with it. Well, and if money's, yeah. money's the tool, they can decide what they want to do with it, whether they want to be corrupt or not. It's about it's about the valuing of, of life. Not only mm. our own lives, but other lives and the recognition of interconnectedness and interdependence and that sort of thing. Or the idea that I think is what is really damaging is that people are alone and disconnected and therefore one can rise above another without harm. Mm. You know. Um, Andrew said, I think that money has an energy, but maybe not a personality. Yeah, I'm curious well, how everyone thinks of it. Cause this is something we don't talk about because money is like mm. a taboo subject in pagan circles. Hmm. What what would give money a personality in your opinion? Well, and, and how would you describe its personality or its energy? You know, how do you experience money? What do you think of it? Because I bet we have mm. some, some wildly differing answers because we don't talk about it. I think it's probably also changed over the years because, I mean, before we could pay with a card or with a phone, um, we used to withdraw money from an ATM and we used to have physical money and that's how we pay for everything. Now we don't. Now it's just all electronic. 
Mm-hmm. So it, it has it, money and finances and stuff has become more energetic. It's, it's become more air than earth. Yeah, well, that's that's the age of Aquarius. That's what's happening. <laughs> we are moving out of the age of Capricorn and we are moving into the age of Aquarius. And it's not like one day you wake up and it's different. You know, we're mm. we're in a 300 year slide as we move from one element to the other and uh is you know we're not gonna necessarily be conscious of it unless we think about oh what was it like 20 years ago what was it like 40 years ago Mm. so we move through um craig said no money tends to create power with and not over and also um it's power over is this personality Mm, the idea that just the accumulation of money itself is what causes people to choose power over as opposed to power with i can see that read i can see that i i don't think that i think money is just currency i much prefer the term currency because it's it reminds me of currents it reminds me of flow and Mm. it is especially now as you're talking about when money is not physical anymore the cashless society that everybody worries about it really is an kind of esoteric concept you know this this magic sigil this card you have that you know is a talisman with a bunch of sigils on it magically transfers this energy but you get goods (laughs) you get something Mm -hmm. physical for it even though you didn't hand anything physical over you know and perhaps that takes away from the barter aspect of seeing money that way but Mm. it is that fluctuating valuation um, and that energy exchange that you know is cycling and rooting in you that's how i see that energy exchange when i get something physical this is now my value and because of that is imbued with the energy of currency, the energy of flow. And so simply by having this now valuable thing, it attracts more valuable things to it. You know, that's that's very much how I see the energy of money. It's kind of this sticky magnetic energy that draws more and more to it, but only if it's in flow. If it mm. sits, then it rots. It's and of course, um, I'm describing luck in heathenry too which is very much connected to my idea of money and and how it all goes together. So, but Mm. like I said, I bet we all have very differing ideas because we don't talk about it as much. Um, There isn't a pagan thought on money. Like there's probably a pagan thought on circles and holidays, right? Most of us have talked about that at length and we've decided what we think (laughs) and there we are. But we probably mm. haven't puzzled through money yeah. and energy exchange and that sort of thing. Yeah, Andrea said uh, money is a good tool for bartering with, and she also said currency is a very good way to look at it, flowing. Yeah. Um, Richard said money definitely has become like the air element, blows away like the wind all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yolandi agreed. Um, freaking hurricane in a bank account. Yeah. <laughs> I see. So when I talk, because I think of money uh, as transitioning to air, I think of the whole society as transitioning to a more airy thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily it blows away. Air is always moving. Air currents. But it's also heady. It's thought-like. It's intangible. It's, um, you know, and it's faster than water. Water is tangible. But Mm -hmm. we don't think of Mm -hmm. air as tangible because we're in it all the time all the time we are never not in air Mm. even you can argue when we're underwater we've still taken a little air with us for a short time so that we can have some air (laughs) we are the (laughs) container for the air instead of being the container for the water but Mm. so more of it flows and it flows faster and it's a higher vibration but it's more connected to thought which I think actually makes it easier to manifest when you can latch onto that because it's quicker and it's not as physical. There's not as much 
um, physical exchange, you know, weight for weight kind of stuff going on. I mean, two, eh, maybe longer than that, four or five hundred years ago, um, coins were coins because they weighed so much. You didn't necessarily count them. You piled them up and weighed them because mm -hmm. they weren't necessarily all completely uniformly minted. So you might have a coin that actually weighed a bit more than this other one, but that didn't matter because the whole point was to weigh them and have a very physical exchange. Mm. But I think with the whole professional working witch thing, charging money for spiritual services, it's, and it, it, it doesn't just stop here. I mean, it goes into everything, careers, jobs, whatever you're doing, whatever mm -hmm. profession and trade you, you're in, it's about an energy exchange. You do a particular thing and you are given something back for doing that, uh, which is an energy exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and I was actually reading a very good book on shamanism this, this week, last week. And there was actually a chapter on um, being a professional shaman, a shaman who charges money for their services. And something that was mentioned in there was that what, what the guy found was the people who are not charging for their services, we always consider that if there isn't an energy, energy exchange, it affects us, the, the magic user, the spiritual worker. Hmm. It actually affects the other person as well. Oh, so definitely. If, if, yeah, but we, we often don't think about that. So if a shaman has done a healing for somebody and they have not charged for it, there's no energy, energy exchange that took place, that person usually finds that they get ill again mm -hmm. and very quickly and bad. Yeah, it wears off and rebounds usually. Yeah, it kind of, the energy kind of goes like this and goes, well, there's nowhere to hold on to, and then goes, whoop, all the way back both mm -hmm. to both people. Yeah. Um, you know. I, I usually but, think of it as value, and I, I've talked to lots of people because I've, I've done plenty of times where I'm doing free readings or what I don't do anymore, but I used to do, is where I would go to a party and basically be employed as an entertainer. So someone would pay me for my time, but the people I was actually giving readings to were not paying. And that, mm, that did some fucked up shit to my magic. <laughs> Just, mm. it was, it was very strange, but it taught me a lot about energy exchange and value and, and that sort of thing. And so for me, you know, I want the valuation of what is happening in a divination, because that's what I primarily do, so that's my example. I want that to be the same on both sides of the teeter-totter of reader and querent. I want mm. everybody to be invested in this process, because I, I feel it is a sacred thing, in my opinion. I am consulting the gods. You know, this is a spiritual process. And so it needs to be taken with respect and that involves investment and value. And so the easiest way in our capitalist society for people to say that they value something is to trade time for it, which we do in dollars. We trade our time mm. to make dollars and then we trade our time. We trade those dollars for someone else's time to spend it. So um, now that means because that's the way I view it. I'm totally happy to take barter from people because I can see their investment in time in other ways. People bake me cakes. I, I trade artists for beautiful artworks. You know, we're both investing in the process. It's just a different currency, but not everybody barters, you know, but when people are, are like, you should give me a free reading, you should give me a free reading. Well, it will be entertainment at that point. It will not be mm. a spiritual process. It will not be deep. It will probably not be meaningful. And it may even be harmful in some cases because a lot of times the people who are getting free readings, if something negative comes up and we don't all have, you know, sunny rose lined paths for our readings, they are not willing to stay and work through it with me. And I might not be able to devote that amount of time to working through it with them because 
I'm in like a fair environment or something doing short little five minute readings. And so mm -hmm. they get this negative message and then it's just kind of broken off and now it's a wound. And I, I allowed that to happen as an irresponsible reader. So I, I don't do that anymore. That was my experience with that, how it worked out. And it was not good. And I was not pleased with myself, you know, mm -hmm. for allowing that to happen once I learned what was going on and what was happening. So, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why that exchange is important. And it is definitely the easiest route to show the amount of value that the person providing the service places by putting a dollar value on it, mm. you know, setting a price. That's how we communicate value. Yeah. Um, Craig said the energy exchange could be anything if your belief extends beyond money, i.e. gratitude. Mm -hmm. Can be. Um, the difficulty there is, I mean, if we're doing something for friends and family and they show gratitude, we know it's genuine gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a complete stranger, I think it's a bit different there because I can't quite put my finger on it. Well, for me, it's whether or not I'm in a gift cycle with people. Mm -hmm. Clients, sometimes I will only meet them once. A lot of times they end up becoming repeat clients. But um, that there's no opportunity for being in a gift cycle with someone you only meet once. So you have to complete the exchange at that time. But if mm. I'm in a gift cycle with someone, friends I've known for 10 years, and we have regularly exchanged gifts and, and food and all sorts of things, and they want a reading, sure, no problem. Because I know they understand the investment, and I know they will reciprocate at some point and that cycle will be complete and i don't mind having an open energy exchange with the people because i know them and i'm comfortable having that open-ended connection and energy connection strangers i just meet i am not comfortable with that mm. e even as a working witch even as someone who gets paid to do these sorts of things and spiritual services and especially I, I get called for exorcisms pretty frequently. That seems to be the thing I've been set up to do. Um, don't really like it. But in those situations, I never see that person again. And they're not in a situation where they should be entering into an open-ended contract like that. It'll cause more harm. Mm. So there has to be an immediate exchange in that case in order for the work to to seat well. Yeah, and of course, I mean, talking about the working witch, the working witch refers to somebody who, this, this is their li livelihood, this is their living. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who try to do this um, just with gratitude and maybe asking for donations or something like that. Oh, yeah. And they usually find that they end up homeless and in debt up to their ears because they can't pay their bills, they can't pay anything. Mm -hmm. And that affects them, and which affects their work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, gratitude's great, but it doesn't always pay the bills. Yeah, so, it, it, uh, it really depends upon the circumstances. It really does. Um, mm. And, you know, this is, like everything else, this is a variable thing, and it depends upon the environment and the time that you're in and the people that you're around. Because you can't be a working witch without people to work for. This is a community position. Um, you know, if nobody's willing to pay you, you're not a professional. That is the line. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't do it totally in solitary. You can't do it when you're completely alone. So it has to consider all of the other factors that come when suddenly there's another person involved. Because it's your relationship to that person, your relationship in the community, all those sorts of things, you know. And I think to me, when I hear people tell me, oh, you shouldn't charge for that, it says, mm -hmm. I don't place any value in what you are doing. I don't think you're worth it 
I don't think your skills are good enough. I don't think you're worth my time. I don't think you're worth listening to or paying attention to. Because I get told a lot that I should teach classes for free. Because knowledge should be free. I, I'm, I'm a pro proponent of, yes, knowledge should not be locked up in ivory towers and behind impossible paywalls, but people should be paid for their skills. Mm. And teaching is a skill. It has to be learned, it has to be practiced, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, there's no clear cut uh, uh, universal answer that fits all situations here. I don't think there really is. It's witchcraft. Um, Andreas, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Andreas says, uh, I don't give free readings after what happened with Roxy. I think I uh, told you about the lady who kept coming back because she didn't want the message I gave her and it ended badly. That is one one um, difficulty with giving giving away free stuff is that people to start taking advantage of it. They don't accept what you actually gave them. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause, because they don't put value on it, as yeah. you keep saying. Yeah, I've had people that have wanted to become my friends just to get free readings and... Oh, that feels fucking horrible that they mm. would treat me like that, you know, mm. and it's taken me years to recognize it because I've, I've been down that road many times. I want to help people. That's why I do what I do, mm. you know, and, but I also, I have to pay the bills. I have to eat. It's very hard to give readings when you haven't slept and haven't eaten. You know, and you're stressed out, or... and you're stressed out, and you're worried about can I keep the lights on or can I keep my house? Can you know, I the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not expect to necessarily live in luxury through the process of helping people, but I do not expect to just barely survive either. Mm. But that doesn't mean that necessarily all of my magical work is bent on generating large amounts of money i'm not interested in that either you know i just want to be comfortable i think that's reasonable mm. um and i do stuff that's not witchy necessarily although it really is <laughs> like i make a lot of herbal preparations and that sort of thing and the end consumer probably doesn't necessarily see it as a magical thing even though it is for me Mm. Yeah. Um, Craig said I'm a carpenter I once asked my clients to pay me what they thought the job was worth to them it causes confusion as they feel they might insult you if they don't give you money I wanted gratitude well if you knew what you want then that's what you should communicate I think we mm. have this whole thing too that's um, we're afraid to talk about money I mean, we've got a thing going around right now about, you know, reminders to people that it's totally legal in the United States to talk about your wages. And if your employer says you can't, that's illegal. You know, the National mm. Labor Relations Board says that you're allowed to talk about your salary. And people say it's rude. You shouldn't talk about those things. You shouldn't talk about how much money you make. You shouldn't talk about all of that stuff. And I think that's, that's that taboo that we can't talk about money. We can't talk about how we earn money or how much we make and all of that sort of thing. And I don't think that's a good idea. And it gets really difficult when um, we are the product. And most of us who are self-employed or working witches or who do things like carpentry or remodeling or plumbing or that sort of thing, we're actually selling ourselves. Yes, we're selling our skills, but we are proud of our skills. We take pride in, in these, in what we're doing. And we want people to recognize that. So suddenly we're tied up with valuing not just our services, but valuing ourselves. And that is tough. That is super tough. Mm -hmm. I think that's why one of the most common things asked in craft communities, and I mean craft with a little c, like people who sell at craft fairs, is how do I price this? 
because that's that first stepping stone into working for yourself, selling yourself, becoming a professional something. That's mm. usually where that starts is craft fairs. And we don't, we don't know how to do that. And we don't necessarily know how to separate our, our skills and our pride in our skills from that valuation so we can value that thing separately from ourselves because uh we don't want we don't want people putting a, a dollar value on our self-worth that's yeah. terrible i mean that's the problem with power over in money is somebody put a dollar value on someone else's life mm -hmm. so yeah it's sticky yeah should we take a break and then come back with the rest of these just keep the questions and the comments coming and we'll uh, get yeah. to them just now. All right. It's more hot chocolate time. Be right back. See you. Welcome back to the Blackout Chat, and today we're talking about the professional working witch, the professional spiritual giver, whatever you want to call it. 
Put that on my shingle and hang it out. Professional spiritual <laughs> giver. <laughs> yep. Giver. <laughs> Uh, but we also take her. <laughs> uh oh. Here we get into some philosophy. <laughs> good, good old philosophy, yeah. 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 Right. So, Yelani said, I uh, would never expect spiritual services for free. If I can't afford something now, I will save and then get the service. Now, there is something here. I mean, me being specifically focused on healing. Some people need healing when they cannot afford it. Um, I have sometimes told t told people, come along, and when you can, when you've got the money, end of the month, whenever it is, then pay it. But you need it now. Mm -hmm. Or it may be a specific case where I'll say, um, give me what you can afford. You know, there are certain situations where people just need the service and they cannot afford it, and you know, but we have to put a price on, on, on our things to advertise them. Yeah, yeah. And, and mm. I agree. There are times when uh, someone needs the service and they cannot afford to pay. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll talk them through a barter at that point because specifically I want the energy to really land if they need it so bad mm. that I'm willing to do it for less. Uh, I want it to work. <laughs> I want it mm. to be successful, you know. Um, but that, and that's, I think that's another thing that makes it tough here is um, most of us who are professional witches are somehow doing services that we feel are very important and vital. And um, we often can tell when somebody needs them and when they don't. You know, and mm. yes, we need that valuation. Yes, we need that energy exchange. Yes, we need that hook for the energy to lock into and lock onto. And, and that is very intimately tied up with the person's uh, desire for this to work and uh, their investment in the process. You know, and mm. money is a great way to express that. But there are times when we surpass those because we feel the need is necessary and it will work anyways. And, um, but that's not always how it's like. It's, <laughs> it varies. It varies in situation. It varies from person to person. For me, it varies based on my own energy and health. You know, uh, we talk about don't do magic when you're sick. Um, mm. I have clinical depression. It is not a good time for me to be doing my, my daily work if I am so depressed that I can't function otherwise. It'll mm. screw up my magic, you know? So there's a lot of things to consider in all of this, and it makes it confusing. Uh, so. It makes it confusing also shopping around. Because, um, I mean, you know, if you know you need spiritual services, are you always going to pick the highest bidder? You might not be able to afford it, but are you always going to pick the lowest bidder? Maybe not, because you have an automatic idea about the value of what they're providing. Mm. You know, and this this money exchange for spiritual work comes up a lot in the discussion of Reiki. You know, uh, mm. I hear that a lot in those communities. I think there it's it's quite specific because um, when when it came to America um, through Yusui, they were charging around about ten thousand dollars for an attunement, mm -hmm. and the philosophy there was that it's only people who are willing to actually get that money together and pay it um, are worthy of getting the energy yep. and that attunement. Worth and value um, again. Yeah, but that was way overboard. That was like, I mean, ten thousand dollars. I think it was in the sixties. Right, that's some was a, a crazy, massive crazy amount of money. Price. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I think a lot of people, as more people got attuned, they kind of went, "This is ridiculous," and then they went the complete opposite and started giving them away for free. And that didn't um, work well either. Well, people are still doing it. 
Um, True. I think it's I think it's sort of settled down now. I mean, I think the average price for an attunement is one hundred and fifty dollars now. Uh, it's um, like two to three hundred here, but yeah. you know it's going to vary because of the market and the cost of living and and so on and so forth. Like every other service does, mm. right? It's it makes it part of that um, societal value that assigned societal value. How much is a dollar worth or a rand or, you know, whatever your currency is and how mm. much, um, how does it spend? Cause that changes. When we hear the phrase, mm. you know, a dollar is not worth what it used to be. Well, no, <laughs> it's a currency. <laughs> it changes. You have to be aware mm. of that. Um, and you have to be in that flow. And that's one of those things I think I, I absolutely agree with Jason Miller that there's not enough out there about financial magic mm. and money magic. And a lot of it is just like the 200 variations on this single money attraction spell. That is just get a sum of money quickly. And mm. okay, that's a handy tool to have in your pocket, but there's a lot more. There's a, there are many more options than that in many different ways. And I think one of the core, core pieces is discerning how you relate to money and making mm. sure that it is the way you want to relate to money. Because if your thought is money is evil and it's bad and it's anti-spiritual and you want to be spiritual, you will diverge from the path where money is part of your life. Yeah. It's actually one thing I had to learn. Um, I mean, I always used to carry on. I hate money because I did. I hated money because it just didn't like me. And then somebody actually said to me, well, if you hate money, why do you think money doesn't like you? You hate it. It's going to like you, is it? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> so I had to change my whole attitude towards money. Yeah. And I mean, um, if you live in a community and society where you can live a life separate from money and you want to, cool. Mm, that's fine. Do it. Um, you know, if you want to go be a nun or a monk. That's the option mm. open to a lot of people in our society. But if you don't live in that community or you're not willing to um, sacrifice other beliefs to pursue that goal, then you might have to make some different choices. Mm. Um, Craig said money seems to remove the need for gratitude. Mm. I, I, would now, I, I don't know. I would, no, I would disagree with that. I, I mean, I've... I, I get a lot of people who come back and they are grateful for what I've done for them and they've paid me for that service. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of gratitude there. Yeah. I have people that come back and, and want to tip me on top of what they already paid mm. and they're very grateful. Um, and usually at that point, I mean, I did a long time ago, you know, I had to get one of my, my things was always, um, oh, you don't have to pay me for that. And I've stopped telling people no when they try to give me money <laughs> because mm. it's, it's not good for financial magic. Like, don't do that. Um, yeah. And this was a big deal for me, especially when I was doing a lot of um, art and painting. I was a window painter for a while and I do extra stuff. And so I had to get over that. Uh, but, mm. you know, I, 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 think people express their gratitude through money very frequently. And it's because of that whole valuation thing. Uh, they, they've decided to spend money uh, with your service because they value it. And that was the energy exchange and it's already established. And so that is, is their way of saying thank you and that they are grateful for the service and they appreciate the work and that sort of thing. Um, you know, but if that I is, think, if that is not yeah. that for you, I think you probably need to tell people that. Although I'm just thinking that there is, there is another side to this as well. And it probably is true um, that money removes the need for gratitude because I don't know if it's gratitude or just taking things for granted, but quite often, I mean, you go into a supermarket you pick up a few things, you pay for it, and you walk out. There's no gratitude involved. Mm. 
But it's because you've taken that whole thing for granted. I don't think that's because of money. I think that's because of the normalization of grocery stores and the separation, yeah. the separation of work. But I mean, think, thinking about it from from Craig's point of view, being a carpenter, I mean, if he um, makes an item for somebody, they come along, they just pay it, they walk away, and there's no gratitude involved. Mm. You know, because what it is, they wanted something, they got it, they gave money because that's what Craig wanted, and they walk away. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Faceless capitalism. Mm -hmm. So many steps from the person who actually grew our food or, you know, the person who raised the cattle and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can see it from that point of view. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think that's the money itself. I think that's the the systems in place. For our society no. i don't know there are um there are a lot of different a lot of different views mm. uh, richard said people can show gratitude by paying properly for a job well done same with spiritual services if they don't appreciate the services the service they don't want to pay yeah, that happens everywhere. Uh, I think in every every profession and trade. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea said, let me scroll down a bit here. Oops, scroll down too much. There we go. As an artist, I feel comfortable with asking for a fair price. So if I do some witchcraft, then I will be the same. Mm. Yeah, the difficulty is trying to figure out what the fair price is. Um, it does take some research sometimes. Um, uh, there was a discussion going on between Andrea and Richard. <laughs> I'm glad we have these chats in the chat. Uh, trans men or women? No, yeah. they're fucking not. No. Uh, okay, not sure what to do with that. Um, Craig said, uh, if I make an item, then money becomes a bartering tool for the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But as we said, I mean, as you said, it takes away from gratitude. Um, in some cases it doesn't, we see that, but in other cases, I mean, have you ever had, have you, have you ever had a time for stuff. Um, a client who came back and was appreciative and showed gratitude for the work that you did for them. Let's, let's, let's ask that question. Do you want me to get rid of that person? Yeah. Okay. Da, 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 da. Uh, Andrew, I agree with Craig. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's the most I can do with that. Yeah. Fucking bigots, man. Yeah. That looks like from referral. All right. Where were we? So, I think we've discussed money and money and money. Money. Mm. <laughs> Which, you know, is probably really the most controversial part of the equation of being a working witch because the people that are saying you shouldn't charge money for this service are rarely saying don't do the service mm -hmm. right then for me that's what makes it very frustrating is they obviously value it they want it 
they just want it for free mm. so uh you know that that usually isn't a question people tend to think there should be readers there should be healers there should be you know people doing these things uh but they disagree on price yeah i think that is that's the biggest thing and i mean as i say different currencies in different countries relate to different things i mean what i charge here for one thing um but because i can do it internationally i have to charge a different price overseas yeah and so trying yeah. to put a price on something becomes so difficult sometimes yeah I mean, and, and yeah i'm sorry oh i was gonna say i have a lot of clients on the coast uh i'm in the midwest my cost of living is cheaper so uh, my prices aren't as high as uh, people on the coast which i i'm not real comfortable with but in our uh global society it's kind of difficult <laughs> to mm -hmm. to get that fair market price and that's one of the reasons like when you have you know a service and you don't know what to charge the first thing you should do is go see what other people are charging for that uh mm -hmm. you know because usually they've figured out the market and they know what is reasonable and that sort of thing but it's I mean, it's difficult diff yeah you know, the other difficulty there is quite, especially when somebody first comes into the market or has a new product or service they want to want to provide um trying to put a price on that and you do you go and do your research and you find the right, right price um you kind of go mid-range but then you a lot of people start doubting themselves and so they'll lower the price mm -hmm. and keep lowering the price and then it becomes price where people look at it and they say well that can't be very good right um and then you know people then give up and don't give the service because they can't pay the bills and they could be very good at what they were doing which is quite sad yeah it, it's tough i mean there's a whole um problem with uh <clears throat> having to figure out how to run a business not only mm. do you need the skills but you have to figure out how to run a business and you know i have lots of friends that are self-employed that i've made over the years because i'm self-employed and all of us started with a love for whatever our craft was you know no matter what it was and then we had to figure out how to manage the whole money business everything else advertising side of things they're they're different skills mm. and they're rough and it's it's a lot it's a steep learning curve to go from this is a hobby and i really enjoy it and i've built some skill or i've studied and gotten my licenses and all of that sort of thing to oh now i have to learn how to run a business too mm. and i mean being spiritual doesn't mean you can't be a business person actually i actually started this channel with the idea of it being i was going to call it the magical entrepreneur mm. Um, so teaching magic to people who wanted to be, be business people, um, didn't quite pan out that way, but that was the idea <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we, we have spiritual people, we have business people and rarely do they actually come together yeah. and actually, you know, yeah. become one and the same thing. Um, well, okay. I, I think yeah. we've covered all the reasons for that. You know, mm. the idea that, that money is evil, uh, you know, that for a lot of people, the energy of money is power over and, you know, there, there's a lot of hangups in there, a lot of hangups in there. And there's also just, you know, many of us spent our time studying spiritual things and we didn't go get an MBMA. <laughs> mm. Um, let's have a look at the chat over here. All right. So. Yolandi is going to start a small holding with Andrea to rescue animals. <laughs> um, I think Richard will join in as well. So <laughs> Emma's here. Uh, good on you, Revkai. There you go. Uh, all right, so we've got a group of small holding people going to start. Uh, Yolandi said, uh, here is my problem. I rescue snakes in my private time. 
where I stay, I'm not allowed to charge for this service. So if I should get bit by a venom mistake, I'm in trouble. Anti-venom is expensive. It's a bit crazy. Yeah. But, uh, there's a problem with laws and everything else, like we talked about earlier for magic. We have to put, uh, you know, for entertainment only on our websites and that sort of thing. Just like that. Mm. You're not allowed to charge for the service. It... That's true for really. Yeah. And if there's if there's a community that supports that and allows you to do that because they have money other ways like you know in the u.s it's rescue organizations that are charity organizations that pay for those things there's just laws about who can give money to who mm -hmm. so yeah and unfortunately and that's not that's not a solution you can handle in a week or a month you know yeah. i was going to talk about one of the one of the discussions that came up on a group um it was actually quite an interesting viewpoint um the author of the post said that people should not be paying anybody for spiritual services they should be learning how to do them themselves and then they wouldn't have to pay for them. Um, my argument there was that I am not proficient in all aspects of magic and spirituality. Same. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody is. Um, and I gave the example of if your plumbing broke, would you first go and learn how to be a plumber so you could do your own plumbing? The reply came back, yes, I actually did that. So I'm like, okay, fine. So if you have you your licenses needed... and your certification and you have uh, 10 years as a journeyman and now you're a master plumber. Yeah, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but so. So I said, well, if you need brain surgery, are you going to go and study to be a brain surgeon so you can give yourself brain <laughs> surgery? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when the conversation kind of fell to pieces. Yeah. Um, it, is an, it is an interesting viewpoint, though. Well, you know, there's another thing uh, that goes into the valuation, and that's experience. Mm -hmm. Someone who is experienced can make better judgment calls, may be aware of things that are uncommon, so on and so forth. Many people would prefer an experienced doctor as opposed to somebody who dropped out of med school after a month, right? Many people would prefer an experienced electrician as opposed to an apprentice, which is why there are still grades in most of the trades like that. Apprenticeship and time as a journeyman and then as a master. Because we recognize that experience and breadth of experience is very important in many of these things. And humans specialize. We wouldn't have computers if humans didn't specialize. If somebody couldn't have spent enough time in their life to learn how to build circuit boards and figure out the math and so on and so forth and figure out computers because they had to do everything for themselves. They had to grow their own food. They had to do all the maintenance on their own house, so on and so forth. They had to learn all of the things because who would have written books i mean who would have had time for that if you're growing all of your own food mm. so there are things that everybody should learn to do absolutely everybody should try to learn to brush their own teeth bathe their own body you know those sorts of things <laughs> and but not everybody can do that either mm. the reality of the the world and if you want to be an amateur at something and that's good enough for you, that's fine. Mm. But sometimes certain situations call for a professional. I know I would prefer a very experienced brain surgeon as opposed to somebody who looked it up on YouTube. Mm. Or read yeah, a book about it um, one weekend. Yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, you know, I know I, I, I can read the cards. I can do divination, but I'm not great at it. And it's just something that either hasn't been a, a great interest of mine or it's just something that I have not been able to develop. 
but other areas that have energy work, healing and things like that. Right. I, I can so, technically do Reiki. I, I've been attuned. I'm not very good at it. I, I much yeah. prefer to call you and say, hey, <laughs> I need some help. I'd, I'd, I'd rather ask you to do a reading because I right. know you're, you're brilliant at it. Um, but it's, it's that we have experience. We've built skills in our areas, but we're not great at everything. Yeah. I, I'm not even passable at some things when it comes to magic. Like, I just, I've tried. I've studied. That doesn't mean I can do it. Mm. You know? Yeah. You know, I think that it's an interesting argument, but it definitely fails. Um, because everybody has their, their skills, their skill sets. Yeah. And, and it's exactly, exactly the same thing as we've said before. I think we've said it before. Um, you may be a plumber, but if electricity breaks, you're going to call an electrician. You're not going to fix it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think mm. part of the thing is for a lot of people, um, spiritual skills, spiritual technologies are not as vital to their life as plumbing and electricity. Mm. And that's fine. It doesn't have to be. But that doesn't mm. mean that it's not important to someone else. That it's the, the, my opinion is universal fallacy. You know, my experience is the way that everyone should be, uh, which is a, a big problem for a lot of people. Just because I haven't experienced it, it's not real. Mm. Yeah, you learned you said it with us use YouTube and Google. Yeah, Dr. Googles. Yeah, yeah. It's huge for a lot of people. <laughs> So they don't go for brain surgery. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, here we are on YouTube discussing this. There is absolutely, you know, a reason for content creators to share things. There is nothing wrong with learning from people. Mm -hmm. um, there is nothing wrong with free information. There is nothing wrong with, you know, reading books and that sort of thing. There's also nothing wrong with being an amateur at some something. I mean, amateur means to love it. That's mm. okay. We're talking about um, things that need to be done correctly. <laughs> you know, that's why you pay a professional. Because it needs to be done and it needs to be done right. Mm -hmm. um, and... That doesn't mean it's needed for every single spiritual service ever. It doesn't mean every tarot reading you get should be this huge spiritual thing. If you would like an entertainment for 30 minutes that is tarot themed, cool. Have at it. I have no problem mm. with that. And if somebody wants to do that for free and that sort of thing. But I think you need to be able to discern the difference between the two. What what is going to happen from a free service and what is going to happen from a paid service and why they are different and why mm -hmm. different people might want them or might want to perform them. But I don't yeah, think it's ever across the board. It should be like this. Yeah. There is also the aspect of um, if it doesn't work, they want a refund. Yeah, which is the reason for all of the legal disclaimers, because how do you prove in a court of law that magic didn't work? Yeah. You know. I mean, even so, I mean, if you go to a doctor and you get medication and that medication doesn't cure you, do you go back to the doctor for a refund? No. Because they provided a service. Yeah. You know, for their, their skills and their time. Well, you know? and you know... As a, a working witch, setting realistic expectations is a large part of what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, no, you cannot call me for a spell to bring back your boyfriend and he's going to show up like a zombie with roses and chocolates on your step by 8 a.m. tomorrow. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't claim to do that. I don't think that's a reasonable expectation for magic. So, mm -hmm. you know setting those reasonable expectations and explaining what I actually can and can't do, I think is um, an important part of the process mm. for a variety of, of types of working witch. Yeah. Actually, so def in, in all caps, 
definitely prefer an experienced brain surgeon. Sorry for shouting, just broke my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of like driving down the road and telling somebody to turn the music down because you can't see properly. <laughs> how it works it's all sensory input <laughs> so i'm trying to think is there anything else um we haven't talked about when it comes to you know this topic i mean working which is kind of a, a broad topic and of course here we are sitting here talking about it as two working witches that's mm. our viewpoint we have both decided to be uh, professional spiritual people at various times in our lives so professional spiritual givers <laughs> see it works perfectly <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, i think we've covered everything but i will say yeah. um years of being a professional working witch has afforded me the luxury of time to be able to do a show like this yeah and the breadth and of experience to, and, and to continue to actually improve your services yeah yeah because you do get that time to study and practice yeah i have the time to specialize mm. so and, and i know not everybody has that that is that is a privilege definitely because it doesn't doesn't extend universally it's it's dependent upon circumstances mm. And not necessarily everyone wants to be a working witch. I know um, back in the day, I always laughed at what I called the pagan to shop owner pipeline. First, you read a book and then you see a movie and then you decide you want to own a witch shop. And that's how you know you've made it as a pagan. <laughs> and it was like that was the goal for everyone. Everyone wanted to own a pagan store. And I'd be like, there's 20 people here. Who would shop where? if all of us own pagan stores, really, you know? So it's not, it's not the ultimate goal. It's not the ultimate endpoint. It doesn't mean success or failure, you know, <laughs> just like mm -hmm. owning a pagan store, same thing. Um, it's just one of the more public faces of witchcraft, you know, after several years. I think we all know mm -hmm. what the public face of early entry into the craft looks like because many of us have been there but then there's a lot of options and a lot of paths so you know I add that because sometimes i talk to people about being a professional diviner and they're like well i don't know if i could ever do that i'm like do you want to no <laughs> then don't oh <laughs> well, i that. thought i thought that's what you had to do to be third degree no no <laughs> you don't you don't even have to be a professional you know, if that's not your thing. <laughs> um, oh, you like said, I'm nowhere near ready to be a working witch. Uh, Richard said, I completely agree with you. You provide a service and deserve to be con compensated. Yeah. There is actually, I actually did see an argument once um, that uh, knowledge, and I, I think they were actually specifically referring to spiritual and mag magical knowledge and books are supposed to be free as well and even extended to that. Um, so people who have spent 20, 30 years, um, you know, practicing and fine tuning their craft and then putting that into, all of that knowledge into a book. They should just give that away for free. Not to mention the amount of hours and days and weeks and months, possibly years that it takes to actually construct that book. Right. Authors deserve to be paid. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. People who are creating content deserve to be paid. That is a service in and of themselves. Um, mm. A lot of podcasters, us included, work on a community donation model. It works. Mm. You know? Um but I agree that knowledge itself should not be locked behind a paywall. Mm. But everyone in the process of um, collating and advancing and imparting that knowledge deserves to be paid. It is a highly valuable service to our community and therefore should be paid. 
So I don't see those two things in contradiction. I think the locked behind paywalls is the making the price so astronomically high that um, it, it becomes a class divide. You know, mm. only certain people can afford this and the vast majority of people cannot and that sort of thing. But um, there still has to be money involved for the exact same reasons that there still has to be money involved in all of this spiritual stuff. It is a necessary service and people need um, the opportunity to devote the bulk of their time to it and free themselves up from, um, you know, just surviving by themselves which i honestly don't think any human can actually do um there's just too much too much involved in that for one person to do entirely alone so that specialization requires the creation of currency and so on and so forth down the line yeah andrew said i'm part-time working which yeah yeah it's a normal work. Yeah, many of us have, uh, yeah, mundane day jobs, <laughs> you mm. know, uh, we got to do those things because um, I, I would love to be so busy as a reader. No, I probably wouldn't actually. I enjoy my downtime and time to be in my garden. Um, I'd, I'd love to be, have people walking through my door day in and day out coming for healings, but you know. Yeah, <laughs> so that you could... You could do your craft full time and pay the bills. Um, mm. I'm not at that point in my life. I have been at that point in my life previously, um, you know, but I'm not there right now. I'm I'm semi retired, part time retired working witch. <laughs> I'd rather sit around a kitchen table and chat with other witches, honestly. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I prefer to do with my witchcraft time these days. <laughs> It's more fun. <laughs> um, Emma said, so true with skill sets. I work at a hospital and there are some professionals there. I wouldn't leave in charge of looking after my dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. professional doesn't mean good. And yeah. high prices don't mean competent, unfortunately. Um, there's that whole process of vetting and, uh, it's why one of the things I tell clients when they say, is there anything else I can do for you? I'm saying, well, if you really think I'm actually a good reader, tell your friends mm -hmm. because uh, it is reputation that, you know, carries through because it's really, it's what you have to do to find somebody uh, to be a professional for you. You judge them on their reputation and what other people say. That's why Yelp and uh, eBay reviews and everything else are so important. We trust other people to tell us mm -hmm. their experiences and whether or not we can trust things. We, we value that, that collective opinion, which is also why people pay for those reviews and that sort of thing too, because they found it's one of the most important things. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I've always joked that when I go to the ER and uh, there's a doctor, I said, I'd like to see your Yelp reviews. <laughs> it's terrible. Why not? Not really when I've been in the ER. I've always been unconscious, but, you know, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should anyway. Uh, but, well, I mean, word of, word of mouth is and referrals are definitely... The best way to advertise anything yeah any business any person they're also not a hundred percent because there's always going to be uh that person who's There's upset or um especially doing divinations people get mad at me that i don't tell them the rosy outcome that they want to hear and i'm like i i can't change the cards i'm not that mm -hmm. kind of reader i ask the gods and it's not always good I will work through it with you. I will explore as many possibilities as I can, but I don't just give happy readings because I don't just get happy answers. And mm -hmm. some people get very upset with that. And I try to tell people that up front. And I'm like, if, if that's a thing, I'm not the reader for you. Seriously. Um, but most people won't say, oh, I only want a happy reading <laughs> right out of the gate. Um, but, you know, I have um, 
people I know, because I'm part of like uh, professional divination communities, which if you're going to be a professional witch, find others who do the same thing you do and charge for it and, and network because you can help each other. But mm -hmm. there are some people that are professional diviners that don't give negative readings. They don't want to. It's for their 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 own way of working and their own ethics. And, you know, I can refer people to them. I'd be like, this person would be better for you. Because you'll only get the rosy stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it depends. It depends what people are looking for, you know. But I think but that's... Huh? I mean, if you do a reading and you see something bad, I mean, how do you make it rosy? Some people can put a positive. It it? Some people can put a positive spin on everything. Okay. I and see you, I see you're going to be in a car crash and you're going to die. How the hell do you put a positive spin on? That? But at least your family will have good insurance. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I I. I'm not one of those people, but I know there are people that can do it and do it ethically. And I know some people yeah. just, um, they might do, um, in astrology, we'd call it a consultation chart. We double check and see how the reading is going to go. And if it's not going to go well, we may say reschedule or book with another astrologer because we, you know, yeah. yeah. So, Obviously, I don't refer people to uh, readers that I think are unethical, but there's different mm. reading styles and there's different approaches to it and there's different philosophies behind it. And you have to find somebody that you connect with and that, you know, you have the same goals in the process. Mm. Yeah, you only said I prefer a true reading, happy or not. Yeah, me too. I'd rather know what's going to happen so I know which direction I need to take. Yeah makes more sense anyway well and then we get into the whole fate versus free will thing with readings yeah. and stuff about whether you can change it so should you know bad things because if it's just absolutely going to be bad no matter what you do then you're probably better off not knowing but if you can change something then you would be better off knowing and, yeah. mm. <laughs> <laughs> go watch the show on fate versus free will gets complicated <laughs> gets complicated super fast super fast mm. <laughs> yeah. Craig said, I know a lady who stopped giving readings. She found as she got older that her readings were not happy anymore. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think as we get older, we start seeing a bit more truth. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've had some friends like that who have stopped because things mm. just get darker and darker and darker. And I've known several readers that um, have stopped in the last couple of years. Um, there was a big to do about 2020 in the astrology community for the last 40 years. And a lot of people were just like, I've looked past that and I don't want to talk about it, mm. you know, cause I don't have anything good to say. So it, it's tough. It's tough. Um, I do really admire the people that can always see the positive in situations. Um, I really I strive for that skill and I, I work at it because I, I can't always do that, mm. you know, but there are people who are very good at it. So, and mm. I go to them for readings. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, <yeah. laughs> I mean, should a, should a working witch um, do for themselves what they do for other people? I mean, I do my own readings for myself and my own divinations, but I, I go to others for consultations and readings too. Mm. I think it's really important not only to um, get the information from a different perspective, because especially when it comes to interpretation, you could always be lying to yourself. It, it's, mm. it's tough, especially when it comes to readings. Uh, but I want to know how other people practice their craft. Um, I want to experience how other people practice their craft and, mm -hmm. you know, um, to understand and, and compare and improve and everything else. And that's a pretty, 
open thing in the astrology community. Um, you know, getting consultations from one another, learning how they do things, especially um, because not a lot of people necessarily teach that because it's just their own method. You know, and it's not mm -hmm. like a, a great system they've derived or anything else, but, and again, they deserve to be compensated for that time. Um, I, I've seen plenty of astrologers where I have been up front, hey, I am a an astrologer too so you know and most people are usually delighted to be able to talk shop with somebody else mm -hmm. in the context of a reading and a consultation um so because yeah. i actually discovered something interesting specifically with uh egg limpias or egg, egg cleansings because for some reason i don't know if it's just me who's seeing this but egg cleansing has just become the biggest thing on groups. I don't know if it, it seems to be very much South Africa. Hmm. You just got people posting pictures of their eggs in their, their glasses. Can you read your egg, my egg for me? And I've seen some people say never post pictures of the eggs because the negativity that is in the egg transfers to, to the people viewing the picture. Mm -hmm. I've seen people saying that you should not ask anybody else to read your own egg. But the most interesting one I came across recently, never do an egg cleansing for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is you have the, the egg in your hand, you brush it over your body. All that's happening is the energy... It's just going right through. ...and transfers straight into your hand chakra and goes straight back into the body. <laughs> I, I can see that logic too. I mean, there are some yeah. spiritual practices that another person has to do straight up. That's how it works. You can't do mm. it to yourself. You know, I think it mm. depends on the tradition and the practice and that sort of thing. Um, I, I teach tarot reading and uh, by and large, the thing I get asked the most is how do I read for myself? And some people, <clears throat> by the time they get through my class, they decide they're not going to do that. Because the process, in my understanding, and this is not universal, but the process for reading for yourself and reading for someone else are different. They are different skill sets. And mm -hmm. uh, you have to develop them nearly separately or at least in tandem. So, you know, and, and that's a, a common problem. And, and, and like exorcisms. I wouldn't do my own exorcism because I wouldn't be capable of it. Yeah. You know, I would have to have someone else do that. Mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there have to be other services and that sort of thing. Um, when I do mediumship, I really need somebody else there because tape recorders don't function. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what happened. So, you know, there, there's all sorts of things where there are reasons for more than one person. Um, mm. Yeah, you only said I know of tarot readers who don't read reversed cards, they turn it upright. I don't agree with that. The card landed that way for a reason. Yeah. It depends on how the person views it, though. Yeah, I can argue both sides of that. And, and, mm. a, and a middle path. <laughs> um, but I think the big deal is you need to know what the vocabulary is you're working before you read. Don't decide in the middle of the reading um, that, mm. oh, you're suddenly going to read reversed or, oh, you're suddenly not going to read reversed. Um, because that's almost always, I don't want that kind of response, you know? Mm. Well, that's kind of a conversation and decision you make with the cards before the reading, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there are times when I don't read reverse cards, um, and I have my reasons for that. Uh, but I know that before I shuffle and turn, uh, long before, uh, that that's what I'm going to do. And I'm there are readings I do where I don't use a whole deck. You know, I only pick out certain cards to do the reading with and that sort of thing. It's a tool, and there's a lot of different ways to use it. Um, and I, th you have to figure out what works 
consistently for you. And the only way you do that is with trial and error and practice and good journaling. So, um, you know, lots of people have, have different opinions about that because it's, it's how you use a tool and it's a really, really variable, um, tool, especially if you're referring to Tarot as the big umbrella and thousands of different decks, you know, different ways to do it, different kinds of spreads, all sorts of stuff. So. Mm. You landed, you said also put uh, tinfoil behind the egg. <laughs> actually, actually the, the solution <laughs> there was actually um, to uh, put tie a red thread around your hand with a knot over the, the hand chakra. Um, it's not, it doesn't work fantastically, but it mm. might help. Um, the other alternative is to do a fire limpia instead of an egg, egg limpia. So, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, eggs, eggs are great for cleansing. There are services that really can only be done by another person. And mm. there are services that can only be done physically. Mm. There are services that are best done at a distance. And then there's a whole range of in between. So. Mm. Yeah. All right, so I think we should bring today to an end. I think we've covered everything. Hopefully. Nobody's put brain. any more uh, comments or questions in the chat for a while. So, mm -hmm. And of course, if we haven't covered everything, you know, and you go to sleep and you think of something, uh, message us. Uh, share it on our Discord or in our Facebook group. Mm. We're always happy to continue the conversation. And sometimes that results in us doing a whole new show. So... Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to check out our movie, movie and TV reviews, then go and join us on one of our support channels. Yes, Saturday. All of the links are in the description. Saturday on our um, supporter, uh, What's on the Telly, we are releasing our review of the Warlock movies. So if you'd like to check that out, apparently it makes uh, Lee laugh a lot. <laughs> it's hysterical. It really was. Because they were so crap. <laughs> <laughs> but you can check that out on Patreon or Ko-fi. Um, it's only $3 a month. We release two episodes of What's on the Telly a month. And of course, once you sign up, you get access to all of the back episodes uh, that we've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Craig said, so just busy listening. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, then. So we will see you next week. I have no idea what we're doing next week because we forgot to discuss it. <laughs> we uh, uh, quickly clicking things here. Quickly, quickly cursing. Cursing is what's on the list. Oh, we're doing cursing. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes. So if you'd like to come and hear us swear a lot. <laughs> sorry, sorry, no, that's the wrong cursing. Okay. <laughs> Although we can, we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. We do it anyway. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye.